Yeah, so welcome everyone to this lesson on the problems in regression with R. There are some works that are being done around me, so there are some noises in the background. Later on, if they become so loud enough, you could hear them in the background. And uh, pardon me for that if you kind of hear um, this noise. So my name is Elijah Pia from Ghana, and I am an economist by profession. I love everything about R, and so it's the very reason why you will always see me smile. Yeah. And that is reflecting right in, in, in my picture that is shown on the screen. If you want to reach me, that is my email to there. And so we have these presentations on statistical inference. And so far, we've been looking at these ones. We've covered the first, the second, and we are on the third. And I believe that this third lesson would be in three Zoom sessions. The first one has already been covered. And now we are going to look at regression problems. And then the next uh, presentation will be on other regression models, generalized linear regression models, where we look at logit and probit models. And then we bring regression analysis to an end and continue on with the fourth lesson that has to do with comparing two means and the rest. So the goal for this lesson is to understand the concepts of multicollinearity, heteroscedasticity, and autocorrelation. And so we would like to look at the assumptions underlying the classical linear regression models. So what are the assumptions of regression models? The first one is that the regression model is linear in the parameters. And remember from our first lesson, we got to realize that whenever we mention the term linear regression, we simply means that there is linearity in the parameters, although the independent variables may be linear or not. The second assumption is that the values of the independent variables are considered to be fixed or independent of the error term. So we have a situation where the unobservable factors or the error term must have nothing to do with the independent variables, else it makes our findings actually wrong. The third assumption is that the mean value of the error term is zero where we've come across the fact that the sum of deviation is always equal to zero or the sum of the error term is zero. And so the mean, which is simply the sum of the error divided by the sample size will still be zero. The fourth assumption would be that the variance of the error term is constant or it is homoscedastic. We shall understand this intuition much better um, later on in the slides. The fifth one is that there is no autocorrelation between the distance So given, um, an observation, the first observation and the second observation, the error terms associated with each observation must not be uh, correlated or must have nothing to do with each other. They must be independent. And so that is the meaning behind the fifth assumption that there is no autocorrelation between the disturbances or the error terms. The sixth assumption is that the number of observations must be greater than the number of parameters to be estimated. Of course, if you have two independent variables, you have three parameters, beta zero, beta one, beta two. And so we expect that your sample size must be greater than these parameters that we are going to estimate in regression models. The seventh one is that there should be sufficient variation in Xs. Well, it is very difficult for us to have values of independent variables that are actually the same. We see this sort of variation in there so that one variation in a dependent variable can actually explain the variation in the uh, dependent variable. And so we have this sort of situation there. There must be sufficient variation in Xs in order to explain the behavior in the dependent variable. The eighth assumption is that there is no exact collinearity between the independent variables. That is, the independent variables in your regression model must have no exact relationship between them, right? So we understand this intuition very soon as well. The ninth assumption is that the model is specified correctly. This is something that we may not discuss for the, for the presentations on regression analysis, However, we just need to be sure that anytime there is a problem that is being asked and we are seeking solutions to certain research questions, probably our model will fit the kind of research question that we are really asking, all right? Uh, so like in our first lesson, we got to realize that we're looking at how, for instance, the years of education can affect the average wage of people in the United States. So typically when we, um, formulate regression models, we'll assume that more, more often than not, our model is specified correctly. However, I know that there is a test somewhere that can test whether our model is specified correctly or not. However, let's understand that one of the assumptions of regression models is that the model is specified correctly. 
The tenth assumption is that the stochastic error term, so just error term, is normally distributed, all right? So there should be a normal distribution of the error terms as well. So these are the 10 assumptions underlying the classical linear regression models. We are going to emphasize on four of these. Um, that is the fourth assumption, the fifth assumption, the eighth assumption, and then the tenth assumption. So we are going to look at these um, in this presentation. So we are going to start with multiple linearity, all right? And so we are going to understand the goals of that would be to understand the nature of multiple linearity. We ask ourselves if multiple linearity really is a problem in regression models, what are its practical consequences? How do we detect that problem? And what remedial measures can be taken to alleviate the problem of multiple linearity? Now, before I start delving into the problems in regression analysis, we must understand the fact that um, uh, we've gone ahead to uh, work with a real world data set and we, we are just going to demonstrate side by side how these can actually be applied to real economic problem, right? So what is multicollinearity? Now the assumption is that there is no exact collinearity between the independent variables. So let's take this regression model on the screen right now where we are looking at um, the dependent variable weight and how years of education and years of experience actually affect the wages of people in the United States. This is the regression model we've come across in our first uh, presentation. So the idea about relationship or collinearity is such that there should not be an exact linear relationship between the years of education and the years of experience. Because if there is an exact linear relationship, it means that it would be difficult for you to look at the effect on, of education only on wage and the effect of experience only on wage. And remember that in multiple regression analysis, whenever we are interpreting the coefficients, for instance, the education, we'll know that the beta one represents a certain change in the wage, uh, which is explained by a one unit change in education, holding the years of experience constant, right? But when education experience have some kind of relationship, it means that if experience changes, it also affects education before it goes on ahead to affect wage. So the specific changes in each of these variables will not really be captured. And that is the problem that we want to avoid. And so there should not be an exact linear relationship between the independent variables. And if this assumption is violated, then it leads to the problem of multicollinearity. So let's take, for instance, this particular table. There are actually two types of multicollinearity. We have the perfect multicollinearity and we have the imperfect multicollinearity. So looking at this table, you would see that the values of X1, look at the values of X2, you would notice that the values of X2 would be five multiplied by the values of X1. If you've seen that right now, you would notice that the first value five times five gives you 25. The second value of x1, 12 times 5, gives you 60, right? So what we are just trying to say is that x2 is dependent on x1. Actually, the values of x2 is perfectly dependent, dependent on the values of x1, such that multiplying 5 by each value of x gives you x2. That is the case of perfect multipollinearity, but we're just going to establish that very soon. Now, for the values of X3, we are just adding some random set of numbers to the values of X2. So we are adding 3 to 25, 0 to 60, 7 to 40, 1 to uh, 75, like that, so that we can get the values of X3. Somehow, you would know that these are just some random numbers. And so the relationship that would exist between X2 and X3 would not be perfect, but there would be some relationship, just some addition of random numbers to the values of X2. So the question is, how do we tend to look at how these variables are related to each other? And so we use what we call the correlation coefficient. So let's go right into R and have a practice of that. So I have already taken time. This is the same script that we were working in for our first presentation. And so we are just going to continue right here. In another session in the same script where I've named it as regression analysis part two, right? So this is the data that I've created right here. So we have the X1 value. So I'm going to run that 
And then we also have the X2 values, which is simply five multiplied by each value of X1. And then the X3 would be the values in X2 plus the random numbers that we just talked about. So in that case, if we try to view what those values are in the console, then you can see what is clearly happening right here. Now, one thing that I want us to do is to put all of these values into a data frame. So let me just simply call this one DF. And then we use the data.frame function. And inside of the parenthesis, we just simply pass into it the values, um, the vectors that we've created, the x1, x2, and that of x3. So if we run that, it says data.frame object x1 not found. Okay, so that means I did not run this um, code. Let's run it again. Uh, let's run this one again and run this x3 again. Oops, okay, sorry. You would notice that the value of uh, the name that we've assigned to the first ve vector is the capital letter X, all right? So let's make it lowercase, just like every, every other uh, variable there. All of them are upper cases. Oh, okay, sorry. Let's maintain the upper cases. And so I just need to change this one to uppercase X. Okay, all right. So now, Let's run everything again. So we run this, we run that, we run that, and then we create our data frame. So we can go ahead and check our data frame, and then we have the values of X1, X2, and that of X3. So what we need to do is now to look at the correlation, the relationship that exists between each of these two variables, okay, each pair of variables. So what we're going to do is to use the COR function, and then we are just going into the data frame DF, followed by the dollar sign x1 and then the df again dollar sign x2 when we finish we go in there again and then we will look at df dollar x1 and then let's look at the relationship between that and then x3 and then when we finish we we'll just check the correlation between x2 and then the correlation between x3 hmm we have to write these three lines of code that looks very tedious, right? But don't worry, there is a solution. So what we're going to do is to just simply highlight this and run that. And we notice that the relationship between X1 and X2 is simply one. Which remember in correlation analysis in our last two presentations, we got to realize that a value of one means that there exists a perfect positive relationship between the two variables. Now, if we check the correlation between X1 and that of X3, the relationship is 0 0.9967, which is not perfect positive relationship, but it is a strong positive relationship. Good. And then if we check the correlation between X2 and X3, we also find out that, yes, of course, it is also a very strong positive relationship, yet it is not perfect relationship. Now, one thing that we can do with this entire data frame is that because the entire data frame actually holds values which are numeric in nature, we can just simply go ahead and write our COR function and then put in the data frame, which will then create for you a correlation matrix where the diagonals are always going to be one because each variable is correlated with itself perfectly. So the correlation is just one at a diagonal, but we are just looking at the off diagonals. And so we look at the correlation between X1 and X2, and that simply is one there, but the correlation between X3 and that of X2 is simply this value 0 0.9967, which is a strong positive relationship. So that is how we just look at the relationship that exists between variables. Let's go back to the slides and then continue from there. So this is the exact situation that we actually had here. So we notice that the correlation coefficient that we had for X1 and X2 was one. And so it means that the relationship that exists between X1 and X2 is perfect, all right? And the relationship that exists between X1 and X3, X2 and X3 is simply 0 0.9967. This is not a perfect positive relationship. So we just say that, well, there is some positive relationship between them, yet it is imperfect, all right? So this notion, if we apply that to regression models, now assuming that we had data for a dependent variable which is regressed on 
X1, X2, and X3. So X1, X2, X3 are independent variables. Then the mere fact that there exists some relationship between them, whether X1, X2, X1, X3, or X2, X3, the relationship that exists between them suggests that there is the problem of multiple linearity. However, one of them, which is the correlation between X1 and X2, is just perfect. And remember the assumption that there should not be an exact linear relationship. There should not be a perfect linear relationship. That is assumption. So let's carry on. And so at the end of the day, we kind of, in R, created a correlation matrix to give us an idea about the relationship that exists between these variables. So let us consider this regression model where the dependent variable is consumption. So we are looking at how income and wealth affect consumption. Now, in which case, we're just going to say that, look at income and that of wealth. Now, probably a person that has a lot of income definitely will have to consume more. And if you have less income, you also consume less. So there's kind of a positive relationship per theory there is kind of a positive relationship between consumption and that of income. So the higher your income, the higher you consume. The lower your income, the lower you consume. So they move in the same direction. So positive relationship. But let's look at the independent variables, income and that of wealth. Don't you think that a person that actually has more income likely is also going to have more wealth? So somehow we see that the income and wealth would have some kind of relationship. So it would be very difficult for you to look at the effect of income alone on consumption when wealth is introduced into this regression model. But let's look at this issue. Multicollinearity is a question of degree and not of kind. So it is not the mere fact that multicollinearity exists that is a problem, no. But the degree of the multicollinearity is the problem. So, the do nothing school of thought actually comes out to say that multicollinearity is God's phenomenon. All that they're just trying to say is that for every regression model that you run, there is likely going to be multicollinearity there. So the question is not about the existence of the multicollinearity, but the problem is with the degree with which it exists. So that do nothing school of thought was captured in Woodridge Econometrics. All right, there is a textbook in economics we call it um, um, Woodridge Econometrics, where the do nothing school of thought, expressed by one academician Blanchard, says that when students run their first ordinary least squares regression (OLS regression), the first problem that they usually encounter is that of multicollinearity. God's phenomenon, right? Let's continue. Most of them conclude that there is something wrong with OLS. Some resort to new and often creative techniques to get around the problem. But we tell them this is wrong. Multicollinearity is God's will, not a problem with OLS or statistical technique in general. So technically, what Blanchard is saying is that multicollinearity is essentially a data deficiency problem. They use a certain term called micronumerosity. Econometricians are very good at um, creating terms that are really difficult for us to understand really well. But then... Sometimes we have no choice about the data that we have for empirical analysis. Yes, because per the study, I just go and collect the data and I happen to find out that there is a problem with the data. That is not our fault. That is the problem with the data. So how do we get around this issue? Now, the whole thing is that with multicollinearity, the effect is your regression coefficients, the beta zero, the beta one, the beta two that you are going to estimate, they are still blue. Now, blue is what we encountered in our previous lesson of what we call the gauss markov theorem, which states that the estimators are best linear and unbiased. All right, so the blue simply means best linear unbiased estimators. So the best means that they have the minimum variance. You know, taking the square root of variance gives you the standard error. So if we have the minimum variance, we have the minimum standard error that we can actually get. And that is what OLS seeks to do, minimize the sum of squared errors, all right? The linear means that, of course, the regression model is linear, the estimators are linear, and all those sort of things. The unbiased means there is no bias element. It's just technically the word itself that is very much understandable. So the whole thing is our Gauss-Markov theorem is not violated. The estimates are still linear. But the only problem so far that our model is going to have is that the variance is going to be very huge the variance is going to be very huge. And when your variance is high, your standard error also becomes high, your precision becomes low. So look at how we connect all these terminologies, all right? If you are running a regression model, you want to minimize the errors. 
Now, if the errors signified by the variance, because the square root of variance gives you the errors, if the variance is very large, your errors are going to be very large. If your errors are going to be very large, then the more you pull away from the population, right? Because all estimations that we are doing is actually to predict what the population is actually going to be. So the large your variance, then the less precise you are going to be in, in estimating the population or making generalization about the population. So what this means is that if the true variance, assuming we run a regression model and the true variance was 20, then it means that your variance has been inflated. So you can see from the formula that there is something there, VIF. The VIF is an abbreviation for variance inflation factor. What is just trying to show you how much your variance has been inflated. So for instance, if you calculate, if you estimate your model and then multicollinearity reveals a VIF, a variance inflation factor of two, it means that the variance that you get for the estimators has been inflated twice or two times. So it means your variance now is going to be 40. Meanwhile, if multicollinearity was not a problem in the regression model, your variance would have been 20. So you can see the damage that multicollinearity can do to the variance and your ability to be precise uh, when it comes to estimations. So another effect of multicollinearity is that the confidence intervals widen and so when it widens, it leads to the acceptance of zero-null hypothesis. Remember that after estimating your regression coefficients, you would have to test for significance, right? If your null hypothesis states that the parameter or the estimator is not significant, your alternative says it is significant. So if you reject the null hypothesis, you accept the alternative, concluding that that parameter is significant. But in the face of multicollinearity, the confidence intervals would widen leading to the acceptance of the null hypothesis. And so it would decrease your ability or the probability of you rejecting the null hypothesis and rather lead to the conclusion that you do not reject your null hypothesis and that your parameter is not significant. This is uh, uh, some of the, uh, these are some of the problems that we can actually encounter when we have multicollinearity. Another thing that you can also um, uh, encounter when there is multicollinearity is high R squared value. That is why anytime you run a regression model, do not be happy because if you have an R squared value of 90%, now we mentioned that the R squared value is simply called the coefficient of determination. <clears throat> it's just simply talking about the goodness of fit of the model, how well your model fit the entire data that you gave it for the estimation. Or we can say that it is just simply describing the, how much variation in the dependent variable is being explained by the variation in the independent variable. So a very high R square value means that's a really good fit. However, multicollinearity can result in you having a very high R square value. And so do not be happy when your R square value is very high because it may be due to multicollinearity. So talking about the confidence intervals widening, if you look at the bell curve, we've encountered this bell curve in one way or the other, you would notice that the middle section of the bell curve is called the acceptance region. And then the colored regions are the tails. These are called the rejection regions. So at the end of the day, if your statistic falls within the shaded region, then we reject the null hypothesis and then conclude that our parameter is significant. However, because of multicollinearity, you know, the top of the bell curve can squish down which will allow the tails to also pull far right and then widening the confidence intervals, right? And so if you don't take care, you might rather have your test statistic lying within the acceptance region. And this is what we mean by an effect of multicollinearity that it leads to the acceptance of zero null hypothesis. So the whole thing is that if multicollinearity is perfect, then the regression coefficients of X variables of the independent variables are indeterminate and their standard errors are infinite. So if we have a case of perfect multicollinearity, that is, if we regress a dependent variable on two independent variables and the two independent variables have a perfect linear relationship, then it means that the standard errors, okay, associated with estimating these parameters are going to be infinite. It's going to be infinity. And if you have infinity standard errors, 
then it means you are totally wrong with the estimation, all right? And also you can see that the regression coefficients are determined. So when you have an infinite standard errors, then it means you cannot even actually estimate your, your regression coefficients. But if the multipollinearity is less than perfect, in which case, if you recall the relationship that existed between X1 and X3 and X2 and X3, you notice that the relationship was a strong positive relationship. It was not perfect. So if it is less than perfect, then the regression coefficients, although determinate, although you can estimate them, they possess very large standard errors. And so it means that the coefficients cannot be estimated with very great precision because we want to minimize the standard errors as small as possible, right? But with multiple linearity, if it is less than perfect, then it means that um, you have very large standard errors. So look at something. Usually is the case in regression models, perfect multiple linearity hardly will it exist in the model, all right? So 99.9% .9 multiple linearity is not perfect, 99.9%. .9 so if it is not perfect, the multicollinearity exists, but the problem is not with existence, but the problem is with the degree. Because the higher multicollinearity, then the more you are approaching perfect multicollinearity, and then the larger your variance is going to be, and your the larger your standard errors are also going to be, which is going to create problems, right? And like that. So we are just looking at the degree of multicollinearity, not just because it exists because most often than not, it is going to be imperfect multicollinearity that will exist in the model, but the degree of existence would be the problem. So how do we detect the problem of multicollinearity? Yes, one of them is, like I said, high overall R squared. Now, the whole thing is, if you estimate your parameters, say you have two independent variables in a regression model, and then you, it means you have three parameters, right? Beta zero, beta one, and that of beta two. Now, if you notice that the coefficients, the associated p-values prove that the coefficients are not significant. That is what we mean by few insignificant t-ratios. So if you notice that the coefficients are not significant, but you ended up getting a very high R-squared, that is one way to be sure that, yes, there is multiple linearity in there. The second one is you just need to examine the relationship that exists between the independent variables. And so if the correlation is high, then we have multiple linearity. That is also another way of detecting it. Another way too is by calculating the variance inflation factor between the variables, all right? And how do we calculate the variance inflation factor? It is simply one divided by one minus R squared. Now this time around, the R squared value has a subscript X i. The X is representing the independent variables, all right? So when you run your regression model, the dependent on the independent variables, you have an R squared. That one is the overall R squared we are talking about, which is just simply the R with a square term. But the R squared with a subscript of X would mean another R squared. So how do we kind of calculate this R squared? So various inflation factor we have mentioned as one over one minus this R square with that subscript of X, we'll explain that very soon. And so when you get the various inflation factor, you can also calculate what we call the tolerance, all right? How well your model is tolerated when there is multiple linearity. If the tolerance is very high, then it means that your model is able to tolerate that multiple linearity problem. So you can go ahead and do your estimation. But if the tolerance is very close to zero, then it means that your model cannot tolerate the fact that there's multiple linearity. So get rid of that problem before it becomes a problem. So how do we calculate the tolerance? It is simply one divided by the variance inflation factor. Or you can just go ahead and say one minus the R squared value of the one with the subscript of X. So yes, what is the same R squared with the subscript of X? What is it? Why is it bothering us too much? So let's say that you have a regression model. The dependent variable is wage, and your independent variables are education and that of experience. Now, the whole thing is, if you suspect that there is multicollinearity in there, then you grab the two independent variables that is creating that sort of suspicion. So you are going to take these two independent variables and use one of them to regress against the other. So we have education regressed on experience. Now, that regression is called an auxiliary regression. So after regressing the education 
on experience. You can also go the other way around, like experience on education. We're just looking at the relationship between the two independent variables. The dependent is not a problem, but the problem is with the independent variables. So by running a regression of education on experience, you have an auxiliary regression. If you go ahead and obtain the R squared from this auxiliary regression, then you have that which you need to calculate for the VIF. So that R squared in the calculation of VIF is simply the R squared value of the auxiliary regression where the independent variables, we take one of them and regress it against the other independent variables. All right. So when we calculate the R square from the auxiliary regression and then it is zero, it means that huh, there is no goodness of fit, right? It means that the, the other variable is not explaining any variation in the, 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 the other independent variable. So the R square value is zero, which is very difficult anyway, but we are do, dealing with numbers here. So R squared equals zero. Then the variance inflation factor is going to be one divided by one minus that R square value, which is zero, which simply equals one. So if your VIF is one, assuming that the true variance is 20, then 20 times one is still 20. So if you have R squared in the auxiliary regression to be zero, then it means that multicollinearity does not exist at all. And so your variance inflation factor is just one, which means your variance has not been inflated. But if your R squared value of the auxiliary regression is 0 0.5, substituting that into the VIF, we get a value of two. So which means if your true variance was 20, then 20 times two becomes 40. So your variance has been inflated. So by getting a VIF of above one, then it gives you enough evidence to say that there is multicollinearity, all right? So it has been inflated twice. If your R squared of the auxiliary regression is 0 0.9, 90%, and if you substitute into the VIF, you are getting a value of 10, which means your variance has been inflated 10 times over, all right? A multiple of 10. So if your true variance was 20, then 20 times 10, gives you 200 variance, and that is really a problem, right? So it means that we are looking at how far, or yeah, how far your variance has actually been inflated. That is going to be the problem. But if your R squared was found to be one, then it means that you have one divided by one minus one, which is one divided by zero, which is infinity, right? In mathematics, it is infinity. So that means if your R squared value of the residual regression is one, then you have infinite, standard errors, infinite variance. And so we really have a problem with that, okay? So perfect multicollinearity means the R squared between the auxiliary, in the auxiliary regression is going to be one. That is perfect, but it is not usually the case, all right? Because 99.9%, .9 you're gonna have imperfect multicollinearity. So what are some of the solutions to this particular problem? You just need to drop the variable that you feel is causing multicollinearity. Just gather the evidence know that there is multicollinearity, drop the variable that you feel is causing that problem and your problem is solved. Another one too is to increase your sample size. It is a data phenomenon, right? So remember in the do nothing school of thought, they said that it's actually a data deficiency problem. So just increase the sample size. Uh, there's actually a whole lot of um, formulas that go behind the scenes, but let me just let you know that when you increase your sample size, it means that it reduces your standard errors because when your sample size is great, greater, then the more you are getting close to the population. And so your precision tends to be very high. That is why it is recommended that you increase the sample size. So this is what multicollinearity is all about. So in order to actually look at multicollinearity in this case, then we need to look at two packages in R, the performance package and that of the LM test package. So let's go right into R and start practicing the whole thing. Now, this is where the real world economic problem comes into the scene. So let me just scroll down to another section that I've created, which is regression analysis, real world problem. So we're just going to use a certain data set, which is coming from Greenberg and Costas in an article that they published on income guarantees and the working poor run corporation. And that data um, is such that we have the variable called hours, which simply represent the average hours worked during the year. Rate simply means the average hourly wage in Dallas. The ERSP is the average yearly earnings of spouse. The ERNO is the average yearly earnings of other family members. NEIN simply represents the average yearly non-end income. Assets represent the average family asset holdings. Age is the age of the respondent. DEP is the average number of dependents. And school is the average highest grade of school that is completed. 
All right. So these are the variables that are defined in the data. Now I have the data set in Microsoft Excel format. So we have to import the data and then work right with it. Now, in the same vein, we do have some questions that we are supposed to answer for this particular real world problem. Later on, you are going to have an assignment of that sort where you can have the opportunity to practice what we've actually done so far, right from the very first start when we're looking at the concepts of a statistical inference, all right? So we have a very comprehensive assignment or practice problem where I'll send it later in the group for you to explore and then answer the questions therein. So this is just a typical example of what is going to happen. So the first question is says that you are supposed to regress the average hours worked during the year on the variables given in the table and interpret your regression. Okay, the table actually is referring to the data, all right? So at the end of the day, we are regressing hours, that is the average hours work during the year on the rest of the variables in the data frame, right? So let's go ahead and import it. And it is in Excel format. So if we want to import an Excel um, data file, then we'd have to use the read XL package, the read XL package. So um, I think in what, one of our sessions before, we've actually encountered this package. If you do not have it, don't worry. Just go ahead and say install.packages and simply pass into it in double quotes, read XL. Another way you can also install packages is by going to the bottom right corner of your window interface on our studio just clicking on the packages tab and then go ahead and click on the install button. And then right in here, start typing the name of the package. So if I type R, then R will simply display a list of packages that are matching the first character, all right? So um, it's supposed to show, but I think E, all right, A, D, X, and then it narrows down to exactly what you're looking for, which is right here. Then you can go ahead and click on install. And that also runs the same code as you can see right here. So if you don't have it installed, go ahead and install this particular package and everything is good to go. So I already have it installed. So I'm going to run this um, code library on the package and boom, we have everything functioning right now. There is a function in there, which is simply the read underscore Excel. And so I would like to call this one Hmm. Hours, hours worked. Yeah. So when I import the data, I want the data frame to be called hours worked. So in the read Excel package, all you have to do is to specify the file path. All right. So you can go to where the data is located and then copy the file path, come and paste it in there and import it. Or if your script, which case it is very true that my script is coming from the very folder which contains the, the data set. So if I go ahead and just type the name of the data set, if I go into the files category, then I can scroll down and I can locate the work hours down here. So it is in the same directory with this same script, all right? And so for that matter, I can just go ahead and type the work hours dot xlsx right and then it will be imported therein for us so that is also one sure way to import this now one of the ways i normally use in importing data files is such that for instance if i am not in the same directory where the script is coming from then i would have to manually go through and then locate the file by myself so what I'm going to do is read Excel and I'm going to pass into the parenthesis file.choose function. So I put in file.choose. Actually, there is an E here. Yeah. So I just place into the parenthesis file.choose, which allows you to interactively navigate your way through your file explorer system and locate where the data file is and just simply click on it to open it up uh, here. So let me just use the second method and let's okay. do this so I if i go question. ahead and highlight this line of code and then run then something pops up right here which is the select file so i now need to navigate so assuming i was not in the same directory because i am in the same directory it points me to the very directory here but assuming i was somewhere in the other location then i have to really go through the folders so it is in our mentor class i will double click 
And then I will simply go to inferential statistics. I will double click and then navigate my way to where the work hours really is. Click on that and click on open. And then my data will be imported right in here. So we have the hours work um, in here. Great, so once our data is imported, what we need to do right now is let's open the data and find out what exactly is happening. So we have HRS representing the hours. All right, so we have them here. Okay, so it's just hours this way, but then I think it was HRS, so just hours. And then we have the rates. So everything has been capitalized, right? So maybe if I take time to go through that, that would be something else. But really, if you understand what they all mean, then everything is just okay. Okay, so assets age, dependence, and everything. So everything has been capitalized right here. All right. So these are the definitions. So we refer to them as and when we need them. Okay. So once the data has been imported, there is something else that we can actually see here. There is a first column, which is OBS, which simply represents the observations. If we go down there, there are 35 observations. So technically, I think it has to do with 35 um let's say 35 employees in the run corporation where this data source is coming from yeah so there are 35 individuals uh who uh, were interviewed or whether through questionnaire or whatever the data was gathered okay so these number of observations we don't want it to be part of um the data frame and this is the very reason if you look at the first question that we are going to answer it says that we should regress the average hours work during the year on the variables given in the data, all the variables. So there is an easy way to do this. Now, from what we have been doing so far, we just need to run a regression. So we just go ahead and say model and then the LM function, right? And now I know that the variable, the dependent variable is HRS, capitalized. So HRS, and we're going to regress this on the independent variables and then I'll specify my data to be equal to the name of the data frame, which is hours worked. So now before this comma, I just have to be typing the names of the variables, the independent variables. So like rate, ERSP, and this is how we do it. So ERSP, so plus rate, plus NEIN non-end income plus, all right? But the thing is, sometimes if you have a lot of independent variables, which is the case, you can actually be typing everything. So R has a shortcut to which we can actually write formulas. So the whole thing is, we just need the dependent variable isolated in which way we have done, all right? Now the rest of them, we can simply represent that with a period. So a period, just like that. So this is trying to tell R that in the LM function, the dependent variable is identified to be HRS, that is the hours worked, it should be regressed on every other variable in the data frame. That is what the period signifies. But the point is that in the data frame, we do have OBS, which simply represents the observations. And you can see R has its own way of naming the number of observations. We don't need this one to be part of the data frame. So we need to take it off, right? So what do we do? We just need to select the columns that we need. So right here, I'm just going to say, Hours worked because whatever I'm going to do, I'm just going to maintain at the same data frame. So hours worked, and I'm going to select everything except OBS. But we need to chain, remember? We need to chain this select verb to our data frame. But before this select function can work, of course, we need to call in a certain package, which is known as the tidy verse, right? So here, I'll just come up here and say, um, install, yeah, install.packages. If you don't have it installed, just go ahead and install the tidy verse like that. I have it installed, so I'll just go ahead and say library on tidy verse and run that. So I just wait a few seconds, for it to attach all the packages that we need in the tidyverse, great, great. So what we need to do right now is we can now run this line of code. So the name of the data frame, and then I am chaining the select function, and then I am 
taking away the OBS column. All right. So minus OBS, meaning everything but OBS. And I want to save whatever is left into the same data frame. So let's run this line of code and go back and check our data frame. And you can see that the OBS is nowhere to be found. It just simply ran away. I don't know where it has gone to. We are just here. So the whole thing is now by taking out the dependent variable, we can regress it on the rest of the variable. So now we can go ahead and highlight this line of code and run. Once run, we can go ahead and summarize. So summary of the model. And so let's clear the console to have a fresh view and boom. Now, if you remember the question, the question was, let's see, what is the question? The question says, regress average hours work during the year on the variables and interpret your regression. Now there is a problem here. Hmm. You can see that for the rates, um, the rate simply represents what? The rate, the rate, the rate, the rate is the average hourly wage. So let's go up here. So the average hourly um, wage in Dallas, the earnings of spouse, the earnings of other family members, then the non-end income and all those sort of things. But there seems to be a problem down here. The school variable. Hmm. We have all these values here and they don't really make sense, right? So this is where, whenever you are working with data, you need to explore the data to find out exactly what is happening. So I don't really know why this actually came as such. Maybe it is treating the school variable as a categorical variable. Let's find out. So by just inspecting the data frame, we come here and the values are numbers, right? Okay. But if we check the structure of the data frame, so let's come here. Let me go um, here and say STR on the hours worked. And if we check the structure of the data frame, of course, every other variable is numeric. So we have NUM, 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 but the school is a character. Hmm. That is where the problem was coming from. So it is a character data type and characters are simply like test. So he's treating this one as test and R in the LM function behind the scenes converted that to a factor data type, treating it as categorical variable and then giving us all those dummy results which are really unnecessary, right? So all we need to do is to change this from character to numeric data type. How do we do this? Tidyverse is there to help us. So we are going to grab the same data frame. We are going to save everything that we do in the same data frame. Now we grab the data frame and then we change something to it. What do we change? Yes, if we want to modify a column, remember it is mutate. All right. And so we grab the column and the column is S-C-H-O-O-L, school. And then we make it as numeric and school. All right. So we just grab the school column. We make it as numeric. And then we save that into the same variable called school. We are not creating a new column, but modifying the existing column. So once this is done, we can go ahead and run this. Oh, there was no error. Let's check the structure again and then run. And boom, we have numeric data type. So once that is satisfied, we can just go ahead and run the model again. And then the summary. And wonderful. We have a very nice result here. So by running the regression result, you can see that we have 2.050 E plus 03. And we've addressed this problem before, right? If we really want to know the exact value, then we have to use a function called format. And then we simply pass into it this very value. So if I come here and paste that value there, and then we add another argument called scientific and we turn it to false because it is in scientific format now. And so we are just going to say scientific equals false and run this code. And it tells us that this negative 5.042 ye minus 06 simply is negative 0.00000. Now, the number of zeros 
And then first number it actually encounters is represented by this six. So we're just going to say one, two, three, four, five, six. So there are five zeros before this number five. So here, this means there are two zeros before this number five. There is one zero before this and all those sort of things, right? Great. So um, these values are in scientific format. And so there seems to be so much problems. And you know the reason? The intercept is significant with the three stars. Wonderful. The earnings of other family members, yes, also significant. Wonderful. The number of dependents, also significant. Hmm. But the rest of them are not significant. Do you recall in the detection of multicollinearity? It says that few insignificant T ratios, hmm? but then few significant T ratios, sorry, few significant T ratios, but there is high R squared. Now look at the R squared value, approximately 80%. And we only have three parameters that are significant out of how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight variables, only two were significant. And if we are capturing the intercept, three parameters are significant. So few significant ratios or few significant parameters, but a very big R square. Hmm. Multicollinearity could be there, right? Anyway, let's box on. So all that we're just trying to say is that, well, there is a negative relationship between the average hourly wage and then the average yearly earnings. All right. So pair the variables that we defined in there. And if we look at the value of ERSP, the earnings, so average yearly earnings of spouse also is positively, is it? Yeah, it's positively related to the average hours work during the year. So which means if the average yearly earnings of spouse actually increase by $1, then the average hours work during the year is also going to increase by around this value, okay? Right, so we cannot just interpret it because the values are in scientific form, all right? Very difficult to put them into action because there are really problems with this particular data. So what is gonna happen is let's just establish the fact that yes, well, there is a positive relationship, there's a negative relationship, there's a positive relationship, there's a negative relationship like that, okay? Um, how do we know that we have very few significant variables? We are looking at the stars here, all right? The stars represent the significant codes. So if you see any of these objects, okay, against your values, then it means that they are significant at their respective levels. If you see nothing empty, if you see nothing, that means not significant, all right? So that is how we're able to capture. So if you see any of these objects, the period, one star, the two stars, and the three stars, then they are talking about significance. If you see nothing, all right, then it is not significant. So that is how we do this. You can refer to the other, um, um, the, the previous lecture and you have everything explained right there comprehensively. Okay, so let's proceed. So of course we succeeded in regressing the average hours work during the year on the rest of the variables. We've interpreted the regression model. Yes, of course, we can go ahead and say that the R squared is 80%, which means that any variation in the independent variables explain 80% variation in the dependent variable. <clears throat> okay, the adjusted R squared, remember we said when we keep on adding up the a number of independent variables, the adjusted, the R squared actually increases automatically. So the adjusted R squared is there to adjust to some of these uh, inflation that might inflation of R squared that might come about when we keep on adding several independent variables. So they must be very close. Well, there seems to be some number of gap, but anyway, they are still very close because they are within the 70 to 80 percent range. The P value here, right? If you don't know exactly what this value is, remember we said the minus zero seven means there are zeros before six zeros before this number two, which means technically zero. And zero means it is less than any of the significance levels, 1%, 5%, 10%. So we can go ahead and say that, yes, the model is significant. The entire model. Just that um, we had only two variables that were significant if we're not counting the intercept. The intercept is not a variable. It's just trying to say that if all these values are zero, then this is going to be what the average yearly uh, the average hours work during the year is going to be, right? So we can just take this one away. But out of seven variables, only two were found to be significant. That's really a problem. 
All right, so that's what we've done. The second question says, why don't we create scatter plots to assess the relationships between the independent variables? Now, you see where the question is driving at? We are just looking at the independent variables and we are taking away the dependent variable, right? Good. So are there any strong relationships? Do they seem linear? Okay, let's find out. So in order to create scatter plots, hmm, we know that when we take the plot function and then let's go into the data frame. So like hours worked, dollar, let's select any variable like rates. And then um, the data frame again, hours worked, dollar. Let's select any other variable again and run. We can get a scatter diagram, a scatter plot, right? To express the relationship. Hmm, there seems not to be some, um, not a strong relationship because all, almost all the data are piled up to the left. Uh, so hours, the rate, which is there, I normally tend to forget because the variables are lengthy, you know. So the average hourly wage, I think the average hourly wage for all these respondents are fairly zero. That's something anyway. All right. And we are regressing that against the hours worked. So meaning there is not much relation, but there is one outlier, right? So somehow the regression is going to pull, the line of best fit is going to be positive. But anyway, we're just drawing a scatter diagram. But the whole thing is we are just looking at all the independent variables. So not just two independent variables, so we know that the plot function can create for us the scatter plot. So let's now work with the data itself. So you know what we're going to do? We're just going to go ahead and say hours work, that is the data frame. It is the independent variables, but in the data frame, we have the dependent variable there, HRS. So let's take it off. So we're just going to say select minus HRS, all right? And if I run this line of code, then you can clearly see that we do not have the hours there. We have our independent variables now. Then we can go ahead and pi the plot function to it. That's all. So when we run this, then we get a scatter plot matrix. We call this one a scatter plot matrix. If we had actually changed what we've done here to, for instance, let me come up here. Okay, let me come down here because we're going to do something else. And then I had actually changed the plot to COR correlation. We'll get the correlation matrix, right? Aha. Uh -huh. So the plot gives us a scatter plot matrix where you can, let's maximize the window, where, for instance, if you take this particular plot, then you can look at the relationship on the y axis, the variable that is close to it is going to be the one on the y axis. So, earnings of other family members, and then the non end income. So, on the x axis. And so, we can see that there is clearly a positive relationship, not so strong. But if we look at this one, you can see that they are lining up diagonally, right? So, really, we can see that it's sloping up also a very positive relationship, very strong one. So between non-end income and then the ice axis is going to be assets. So the average asset holdings of the family, there is a very strong relationship, all right? When we look at this one, in fact, the plots above these diagonal um, diagonals where the variables are named are the same things that have just been turned upside down, all right? So you can just see that if you take it this way, it's the same plot here. If you take this one, it's the same plot there. If you take this one, it's the same plot here, like that, okay? So scatter plot matrix, but this one really um, kind of difficult for us to visualize the values itself, right? So anyway, that's it. But if we look at the correlation matrix, <clears throat> why don't we maximize this window a little bit and then run the code again? So every, everything fits within the window, right? So if we do it this way, we have the diagonals as well, here and here and here and here, okay? so. Each variable is perfectly related with itself, but we are looking at the off diagonals, right? So if we look at this value, then it's talking about the relationship between rates and earnings of spouse. And that is 0 0.08. It is positive. It is not even up to 0 0.1. So which means it is a weak positive relationship. So these are the correlation coefficients that we have there. Now, if we go through manually, you see the pain that I have to go through in order to identify which ones actually have a very high relationship. So we need to adopt something else, all right?
But anyway, if we look at this value, 0 0.987, which means we are very close to positive one, right? So this is a strong positive relationship between assets and then the non-end income. So non-end income and assets, they have a very strong positive relationship. So these two have that problem of multicollinearity being high, all right? Even this one, the value is very, very low, almost zero. It means that multicollinearity exists, but it is not so severe as compared to these two variables that have this high relationship. And so the degree of multicollinearity is the problem, not just because it exists. So let's look at that. So how do we actually look at maybe a visualization that gives us the whole picture? So you know something, why don't we create, if we want to visualize um, correlation matrix or correlation coefficients, the plot to do so is called a heat map, All right? The heat map. So this is the correlation matrix. So let's hold it there, all right? But there is a heat map. How do we create a heat map? Hmm. There is a certain package, and that package is called GG stats plot. And then I will load this package. I have it installed already. So if you don't have it, go ahead and install this package. GG stats plot. So I'm going to go ahead and load this one. And once it is loaded, then we can go ahead and then create our heat map. So what function happens to be in here that can create our heat map? If I write the name of the packet, GG start plot followed by double colon symbols, then I can go through and I can see GG comat. GG comat. All right. So correlation matrix. GG means gram of graphics. So this technically would be the heat map that we need. So GG comat, and let me just take away the packet because I have it already loaded. And then let me just simply refer to as documentation on this particular package. Let's seek help. Yes, so it is the visualization of a correlation matrix. Now, one thing that I want to show you is that there is another package that is called the GG core plot, GG correlation plot. That package is for creating the visualization matrix. All right. So when you install this package and load it, and then you are using this function from the package, R will give you another dialog asking you to install the GG core plot package. So there would be a notice down here because I've already installed them. Um, it is not being done here. But if you go ahead and run this code, after you are done and you run this code to load it, and then we start using this one. So for instance, over here, it says that it is taking the data as its argument. And the data is a data frame from which variables specified are preferentially to be taken. And then the core.vars is the list of variables for which the correlation matrix is to be computed and visualized. Hmm. So could it happen that in place of the data, I'm just simply going to pass into it the correlation uh, matrix? I really don't know, but let's try that and see. So maybe I'm just going to go ahead and save this one and call it um, C-O-R-R, -R, all right? The correlation matrix. And then I'm going to place it here, C-O-R-R. -R. Hopefully it should work. If it doesn't, of course, we follow through with what we are supposed to do. So if I run this, hmm, error in names combination. All right, so that is not really working out for us. So it means that we have to go the manual way for which this particular package was actually created. So I'm going to say data equals the hours worked. All right, that is a data frame. Then the second argument is core.vars. So I'm going to say C-O-R dot V-A-R-S. And it's going to be, from the explanations, it says a list of variables. So I can just go ahead and say L-I-S-T list function, and we're going to pass the names of the variables. And the names of the variables are going to be, there are too many, there are too many. All right. 
Could I simply, anyway, there are just too many, okay? Couldn't there be another way of doing this? All right, anyway, so maybe let's go the manual way, okay? So um, let me just go ahead and say the names of hours worked. All right, the names of hours worked. So these are the variables in the data frame. So we use the names function to call out the variables, the column names, all right? So when that is done, let's go ahead and create a list of all of these, excluding the dependent variable. So I'm just going to say HRS, all right? Let me break it down here. Rates, ERSP, ERNO, NEIN, assets, age, DEP for the dependence, and then school. So it says what? It takes in the data, the core dot vast. So that's the correlation variables, the list of variables for which the correlation matrix is to be computed and visualized. If now default, all numeric variables, oh, then why did we trouble ourselves? So you know something, I can just go ahead and clear all of these variables that I've done here. So if I just create the list and pass nothing in there, all right, it means if now, which is actually the default, if it is the default, then I think I don't even need to specify the core.vas because that's the default one, all right? So everything is going to work out. So all I need is to pass into it the data frame. That is all that I need, wonderful. But the problem is we have this, um, we have the dependent variable there. Hmm, we don't need it there, right? So why don't we just go ahead and say hours work select minus HRS, yeah. So yes, we pass in the data frame and then we pipe our select verb to that from D ply R in the tidy verse. And then we just simply take out the dependent variable, which is HRS. And that is going to be the entire data frame that we need. And so we go ahead and run that. So let's run this and see what result that we get. So I think I was actually rushing. You know why? When we looked at this one, it says create scatter plots to assess the relationships. Are there any strong relationships? Yes, we noticed from the scatter plot matrix we had some strong relationships. Do they seem linear? Well, technically, most of them seem linear. But the whole thing is, if you look at the third question, it says create a correlation matrix. So I was just rushing ahead of time, right? So you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go ahead and grab all of these codes and paste them right here to fit my third question. So it says we are to create a correlation matrix, in which case this code does that for us. And then we saved it into this one. So actually there was no need in saving this because we did not actually use this one, right? If we were using the GG core plot package in itself, then we could have passed the correlation matrix object in there. But because we are using the GG stack plot, it rather takes in the data frame, all right? So that is why it is, it is like that. So I didn't want to go through the GG core plot kind of thing because GG stack plot has everything in everything for us. All right, so once this is done, and then it says that create a correlation matrix, which variables seem to be the most related to each other. And when we run that correlation, we got to realize that there was a very strong relationship between this one, which is the non-end income and the asset, very strong relationship. Another one too is this one, negative 0 0.69, okay? That is the earnings of the spouse against the number of dependents. So that is also a strong negative relationship. All right, so these are the ones that are really, really strong, but not including the dependent variable. So anytime you are looking at relationships um, in regression models, remove the dependent variable and look at that of the independent because we are trying to solve a problem of multicollinearity. So now, um, if you look at the plot, let's just zoom into that and make it very big so we can see clearly what is happening. So what is happening here is that we do have 
the correlation coefficients and some colors attributed to how strong or weak the relationship between the variables are. On the right hand side, we have the number of observations, which is 35, and then it uses the person correlation coefficient. So we have person right here. So there are other um, um, arguments that you can use to change the kind of uh, correlation coefficient that you need, whether it's Perman or Kendall. We have treated all of this in, in, in the last uh, lecture, uh, the last two lectures on correlation analysis. So a, a deep green color simply means there is a positive relationship and then an orange color is there is a negative relationship. So these are the correlation coefficients printed on, on, on the boxes, signifying the heat map. All right, so we can see that between school, this value, and earnings of the spouse, it is 55, 0.55, 55%. So that is a strong positive relationship. This one too is a strong negative relationship between the number of dependents and the earnings of spouse. Yes, it is a strong negative relationship between the number of dependents and the non-end income, a strong negative relationship. So a number of them, we see that they are very highly related. And look at this value, assets and non-end income, 99%, 0.99. It is left, just left with a small value to um, reach just one, a perfect a relationship and in fact if this one had been one it means we have to just take away the variable okay because that would be a perfect multicollinearity case but it is imperfect multicollinearity still but it's very strong so we need to be careful how we deal with this whole issue now in this gg stack plot where this heat map has been created you can see that there are some cross out values here all right now the cross out values are the caption down here it says that non-significant Okay, using a certain adjustments, those are some parameters, but let's just say this one is using a correlation test. Remember in the correlation analysis, we had to do correlation tests to see whether the relationship between the variables were significant or not. That's exactly what this GG stat plot is doing at the back end. So what happens here is when it is crossed out, it means it is not significant. So it's trying to say that, well, if you put these variables in a regression model, there seems to be a weak negative relationship between school and then rates, the average hourly wage, but the relationship is not so strong, so not significant, all right? So which means there is some relationship, but because it is not so significant, it is not really going to impact your model if you have these two variables in there as independent variables. But this one is significant, a very significant relationship between school and ERSP. So technically, if you put these two variables, their school and then the earnings of the spouse all together in a regression model, they are really going to have an effect in the model. That is what that is, that, that is what is just trying to say. This one too is significant, yes, 0 0.99. So if you put assets and that of non-end income in a regression model, huh, they have very sig uh, significant relationship to the extent that they are going to influence the model, all right? So these are some of the ways you can visualize and see what is going on. Anyway, that is just a correlation heat map. So the real question now is, is there evidence of multicollinearity in the data? If there is, how do you know? So we need to use the package called performance, remember? So in store.packages, um, we have performance. Performance is one of the, okay. I think I was rushing. <laughs> I don't know, but okay, because I used one of, so I can say it's one of the best packages for diagnosing a model, all right? Linear regression models and, and what have you. So I just I just didn't want to rush too much, okay? Because maybe there might be, because R has over 20,000 packages. I don't know whether there is any other package there that can do something like that, but yes, I believe this is one of the powerful packages. So I'll not rush too much, okay? All right, so these are the two packages that we need right here. So if you don't have them installed, go ahead and install. I have them installed. So I will just go ahead and run the library on the packages. So this one, and then let me highlight this one too and run, right? So once I have done that, now um, the LM test. So how do we actually use this LM test package? If I say L-M-T-E-S-T -E and then double colon, then we now have all the functions in this particular package right, as a list. 
So we have the BG test on the right hand side. It says what? Bruce Godfrey test. It performs the Bruce Godfrey test for higher order serial correlation. Hmm. We have not gone to autocorrelation, serial correlation. So we wouldn't need this one. But you can see that the LM test, it is just trying to say tests our linear models. LM means linear models. Test means we are testing the model. All right. So let's scroll down to something that we can use for because the question is multicollinearity. Do we have evidence of that? Let's go down there and see, do we have anything like that? If I'm not seeing anything that is really helpful, um, this one is model specification. Anyway, let's go, let's go. If I'm not really seeing something that is really not helping out, then, okay, I really did not figure out what um, uh, multicollinearity will have anything to do with this package. And so what about the performance? So let's check that one. So performance, double colon. Oh, we have check autocorrelation. Check collinearity. Oh, okay. It says check for multicollinearity of model terms. Wonderful. This is what we need. We have a whole lot of things like check the distribution, whether it's um, um, normal or not. Check heteroscedasticity. These are other problems that we're going to look at. And then check model and all, all those sort of things. Anyway, so check collinearity. So we're going to say check collinearity. And then it takes in the first argument as X. But let's go right into the documentation and find out. It says that it check for multicollinearity of model terms. Hmm. So all you have to do is say check collinearity or multicollinearity function. So you can use any one of them. And it says that it takes in the first argument x, a confidence interval, verbose, and all other things. But let's go down here. X simply is a model object. Okay. So all we have to do is to pass into it the model. The model we created as M-O-D-E-L. So I'll just come here and say M-O-D-E-L. That is all that I need. I don't need to do any other thing again. Anything that is not currently used, confidence interval is 95%. That is just okay. <clears throat> that is the default one. So if I go up here, you can see that is 0 0.95. So 95%, that is a standard confidence interval. You can experiment with 90% or 99%. Uh, that depends on you. Any other thing, I just want to leave it out. So I'm just going to go ahead and say, check collinearity and pass into it a model. Oh. So by passing into the model, we have low correlation. So these variables, when put into the model, have low correlation because the variance inflation factor is just for rate is 1.10, which means our variance will be inflated by this value if they are included in there. Um, ERSP will inflate by this value, but they are not so huge. Now, the rule of thumb, if your variance inflation factor is 10 or more, it means that multicollinearity is very severe and so drop the variable that is causing the problem. All right. So that is the rule of thumb. If the variance inflation factor is 10 or more, it means multicollinearity is severe. So remove one of the variables that is causing that problem. So um, I think this is a problem because with a VIF value of 140.97, it's supposed to be here, high correlation, but I find it here. So this is a problem that I've just encountered it with this particular function. The VIF and everything is just correct, all right? The calculations and everything are all correct, but it wrongly placed asset in low correlation when the VIF is 140, because I said the rule of thumb is that when the VIF is 10 or more, it means the correlation is very, very, very high. All right. Yeah. So at the end of the day, this asset was supposed to come down to high correlation. And then this one, the dependence and then the age, they are all less than 10. So these ones should have been dropped under moderate correlation or perhaps low correlation. All right. And one advantage is the tolerance. Okay. We said the tolerance is one over the VIF. Okay. So for instance, if you are looking at the tolerance level for rate where the VIF is 1.10, then if we have one divided by 1.10, that gives you 0 0.9090, which is 91. That is the tolerance level that we have here. Okay, so one divided by this one would give you 0 0.28. So it means that if this variable is placed into the model, then the model tolerates it by 91%. Wonderful. This one too is tolerated by 28%. Well, not 50%, but that's, that's also good. But this one, it is just zero because look at the variance inflation factor, 127.89. Now, it means look at asset, 
140.97, very, very big, more than 10, right? And then 127. So these two variables are what we have been seeing so far in the regression model as having that 0 0.99 uh, uh, correlation. So sometimes you don't have to just rely on one particular test of multicollinearity. Just personally visualize some of these things. And that is why the questions ask you to look at the scatter plot matrix and then the correlation um, uh, plot. Okay, correlation matrix and then the heat map. Afterwards, so these are all steps in diagnosing your model. So now, asset and non end income, we noticed that the correlation between them was 0 0.99. So we 0 0.99. So we have to we have to clear one of them. And remember the remedies, remove one of them. The rest of them, we can keep them, this one and this one, this one and that one. So um, there is a way of visualizing this one. So all I have to do is after placing this one in the check collinearity, I can go ahead and place this one into the plot function and then run that. And then we get a very nice plot that is showing you really which ones have multicollinearity. And so the ones in the shaded red region means that multicollinearity is very high. Start getting rid of them, right? And then the ones in the blue region are the moderate ones, and the ones in the green regions are the, um, the low correlations, all right? So you can see that the plot has captured this very well. Look at the assets, high correlation, and look at the non-end income, high correlation, just that the figures um, cause some kind of problems, right? With where to place them under low correlation, moderate correlation, or what have you. So right here, I just have to get rid of one of these. So either I get rid of assets or I get rid of non-end income, okay? And then this one to school, hmm. Also high correlation, so we technically have to drop this one. So you know what we have to do? Between asset and that of non-end income, let's drop one of them and then diagnose the model for multicollinearity again and see what we are going to get. So right here, I'm just going to say, let me pull this one to the right. Let's go grab our model. And then let's come down here and paste and call this one model one. And if we are dropping, um, non-end income and assets. So let's drop the non-end income, all right? So everything but this. So our data should be hours worked. And then we are going to drop NEIN. And then let's regress everything, the HRS on everything, all right? So that's going to work. Because if I run this line of code, then I'm getting everything, but there is no non-end income, okay? So that you don't have to do some of these things manually, like coming here to write your independent variables. So that's why tidyverse makes it very easy. So this is the data frame that we are working with. And go in there and then pick the HRS against all other variables in there, except the NEIM. So if I run the model one, and then I summarize, and let's go back up. So we still have these values in scientific format. All right, the non-end income is no longer there. So what do we do? Let's go ahead and check again. So let's grab this line of code. Let's plot check multicollinearity model one and run it again. And when the non-end income was taken away, hmm. Right, so our model improved. You can see that the asset now has a moderate relationship and is not uh, causing so much problem again, but the school is still causing the problem. So we drop the school again. <laughs> All right, so let's call this one model two, where we drop not just N-E-I-N, so I'm going to pass it into a vector form. So we are going to drop school as well. So we are dropping the negative of the vector N-E-I-N and school, and then regress our HRS on the rest of them. For module two, we check the summary, and R squared is 78. Now, initially, when we ran that, the R squared was 70, 
or it was 80% approximately, right? But when we took away the NEI and non-end income, R squared was 78%. So our model did not significantly improve so much, yet the overall model was entirely significant though, because even the first one was entirely significant. And here also, our R squared is 78%, which has had an improvement, 781, and oh, okay, almost one. So it didn't really also improve when we took out school from the system. So which means the model has problems. So let's check the multicollinearity again. So we plot check collinearity. And now we can clearly see from our plot that by taking out school and non-end income, all the rest of the variables in the model have low correlation because they are in the green region. And then the low means this one. Now you can see that the y-axis has been labeled as variance inflation factor, VIF. So these are the variance inflation factor. And it's trying to say that if it is equal to 10 or greater than 10, it is very high. If it is less than 10, it is moderate. If it is less than five, it is very low. So you can see that all of them are low. So the variance inflation factor for H is close to three. And this one is close to two. And this one is around 2.6 and all of that. So these are very low correlation. So we've been able to get rid of the problem of multipollinearity from this particular model. So our precision has become much higher than before. But there are other problems that we are kind of also encountering because we have more things that we need to do. So this one is just to look at the whether there was evidence of multicollinearity in the model. And yes, we noticed the evidence. The question five says we should compute the variance inflation factor and tolerance measures. And so um, it is just simply this very code, check collinearity. So I'll copy this one and bring it down here because that one calculates the variance inflation factors and that of the tolerance levels for each of the variables, all right? So at the end of the day, um, sometimes, you know, when you know the statistics or the intuition behind what we are doing, you can clearly identify that the variance inflation factor for asset is 140, which is greater than 10. And so when you are creating a table reporting the variance inflation factor for all these variables and your reason for excluding a particular variable, just try to put this one under high correlation, all right? And then this one will come under moderate because it's less than 10. But it's less than five, it comes under low correlation. So this is rightly put there, right? And this one can also be placed under low correlation. And then this one will come under high correlation. And then this one will come under moderate correlation. So if you look at the question six, I think, like I said, most of the things that we are doing, I'm going ahead of the questions. It says that if there is multicollinearity, so this one, um, the question was, is there evidence of multicollinearity? So by running the line of code, that is the check collinearity. Yes, there is evidence of multicollinearity. And so computing the variance inflation factors, yes, we use this one to compute the variance inflation factors and tolerance measures. And then the question C says, if there is the multicollinearity problem, what remedial action, if any, would you take? At this point, if the data is just 35 observations, the data is not ours to, ours to have control over, then we have no choice because you know one of the remedies is to increase the sample size, right? But we, ha we ha actually have no choice over the data. So one of the measures is to drop the variable causing that multicollinearity, and that's what we've done. So I think what remedial action would you take, if any, and so here we drop the variable that is causing the problem. And so how did we drop the variable? By running the model one. So let me grab the model one to model two right here. Okay, and then bring them under question six to have these questions solved. And then we can go ahead and plot these model one and model two. Like that. All right, so that is the remedial action that we actually took. So we got rid of NEIN, we summarized the model, we checked the collinearity, we still had school having a high correlation, we dropped both NEIN and school, and then we ran the model and it's all good now. 
all good now. So we have taken the remedial actions. So this one computed the variance inflation factor and tolerance. And so the check collinearity also gave us the correlation. And in the performance package, so here we have not used the LM test. So let me just take it out so it doesn't um, conflict with your revisions. There was a certain function that is called a check model, all right? And then you simply pass into it the model. So check model function, and then we pass the model for which we were diagnosing for multicollinearity. Um, that will also give you a whole lot of assumptions, and it needs a bigger window to fit. If I run this line of code, it will tell me, unless the plot is produced, wonderful. If not, it will tell us that it is too large like to fit this particular window, yeah? So the RStudio plot window is too small to show this set of plots, so make the window larger. So let me just go ahead and pull this one there and pull this one up and run this one again. So still, hmm, okay, <laughs> let's pull it there and run that again. Still. What seems to be the problem? Still too large, come on. All right, still too large, check model, check model. Uh, somehow I need to refresh this, but I cannot uh, quit R Studio and open it right again. Um, this is the maximum, okay. Anyway, let's zoom out, that will help. So view, zoom out, yeah. So it becomes big enough, zoom out. And now, if I run this and it doesn't work, I will beat up our studio. Well, it is now called POSIT, right? Great. So by zooming out, we now have a very large window and everything fits right here. So it is looking at this. Well, let's take that one out. I really don't understand it personally. Let's come here. Linearity. Hmm. Homogeneity of variance. Yes, this is where we need. Hmm. Okay, we are coming to that one. Influential observations and collinearity. So this is exactly what we need, okay? Collinearity, high collinearity, that is VIF, may inflate parameter uncertainty. So this is exactly what we produce from plotting the check collinearity of the model, all right? So when you use the check model, it looks at all other assumptions, including posterior predictive check, um, linearity, which is looking at the power of predictiveness, all right? So if you want to predict the dependent variable, the power of predictiveness, and it says that model predicted line should resemble observed data line. So uh, these are the predicted ones, the light grid ones. But anyway, we are not looking at that. We are really looking at the more culinary, okay? So here we can see that the assets, the non-end income, and that of the school, these are the ones causing high correlation multicollinearity. So we got rid of one of the, between assets and non-end income, we got rid of non-end income, we got rid of school, and then we got to realize that everything now, even age was having a moderate relationship, but when we got rid of NEIN and then the school, everything now had a low correlation. Okay, so that's exactly what we are looking at over here. Okay, so that is our seed question. So what remedial action, that is, we take this one off. We notice that, well, it did some good, but still multicollinearity was existing. We took school out, we checked again. And then when we plot the second model by taking both NEIN and school out, we noticed that all of them had low correlation. So meaning multicollinearity is no longer a problem in this regression model. So when running a regression model, take away NEIN, take away school, and then you now have solved the multicollinearity. But then the question seven says, we should diagnose the model for the problem of heteroscedasticity, and that's going to be the next problem that we should be uh, discussing. So we go back to the slides and then we continue from there. So just like we looked at the assumptions underlying the classical linear regression models, we noticed that there were four of them that we were visiting. And the first one we looked at is assumption eight, where there is no exact collinearity between the independent variables. We look, we've looked at that, we've diagnosed the model for, right, for that. We noticed that there were certain problems with some variables in there. We got rid of them and yes, 
multicoloniality was not a problem anymore. But then we have other assumptions that we need to look at. So the assumption again is the fourth assumption, the variance of the error terms u is equal or homoscedastic. So homoscedasticity is the assumption underlying regression models. So if this assumption is violated, then it leads to the problem of heteroscedasticity, right? So what is the nature of heteroscedasticity? Now, for instance, if you look at the plot that is shown on the screen, you can see that moving, moving on the x-axis and that of the y-axis, there seems to be a positive relationship between what those two variables are, all right? And we are just concerned with how the points are varying from each other as they keep on increasing thereof. So if we look at the variation of the scatter points up the positive slope, you can see that they are fairly equal. The variation between them is fairly equal. And this is a typical example of homoscedasticity. That is exactly what we are talking about. But if you look at this very plot, you can see that at the initial values of X and Y, the points are clustered close to the line of best fit. So here we created a line of best fit to give it an illustration there. So they are very close to the line of best fit. But as you move up the line of best fit, you can see that the points are spreading wide open from each other. So we have at the initial part of the line of best fit, the variation is so small, but as you move up the line of best fit, the variation becomes larger and larger. This is a typical example of heteroscedasticity. That means the variance for the error terms or the variations is not the same, all right? But it has to be equal or homoscedastic. Oh, homo is coming from the term homogeneous, yeah. <clears throat> so these two plots also show heteroscedasticity. So clearly what we're talking about is you can see that as you move up the scatter points, the variation between them widens with big values of X and that and then the bigger values of y. Okay, so these two plots also signify uh, the heteroscedasticity problem that we are just talking about. Okay, and so this graph also shows us the same thing. So we have the first one being homoscedastic, fairly uniform, right? But the second plot, you can see that the latter part of the scatter point, the variation is very wide, so heteroscedasticity. And the last one also, you can see that the points are very wide at higher levels of age against the residuals. So we are talking about the variance of the error terms uh, should be fairly equal or homoscedastic. When that, when that assumption is violated, we have the problem of heteroscedasticity. So what are the effects? The effect is that the regression coefficient that you estimate, they are still linear and they are still unbiased, but they are no longer best because the variation is not the same. So it no longer has a minimum variance. That is also a problem. We need to minimize our sum of squared errors all the time in regression models. So no longer best, no longer having a minimum variance. So second point, estimate of the true variance will now be biased. So when you have heteroscedasticity and you get the variance or the standard errors for each of the estimates, those values are actually biased. And it says that the direction of bias is even unknown, whether there is a positive bias or negative bias. And so when that happens, the estimates of the coefficient also become biased, all right? And then we just want to avoid this bias issues in, in regression models. And you know, whenever you are testing for, um, re remember in one of our sessions earlier on, we got to realize that in order to determine whether a parameter is significant or not, we had to use a certain formula, but it has to be divided by the standard error, okay? So um, if your standard error, which is coming from the variance is biased, then it means that if you conduct any test, whether T tests, that is the individual significance of the regression coefficient, or the F test, that is the significance of the overall model, whether it is T test or F test, they simply become unreliable because your standard error, your variance is biased, your standard error is biased, biased and so your T test and the F test also become unreliable. So how do we detect the problem of heteroscedasticity? So we have some specific tests, which include the PAC test, the Glaser test, the Goodford quant test, and the general test include the White test and the Bruce Pagan test. So the performance package and the, I think the LM package, yes, for instance, um, would have 
uh, the, the functions that we need to do all these sort of tests. At, at least if you know one or two of them, that is just enough for you to detect the problem of heteroscedasticity. So we are not going to look at all the tests, all right? So which ones are necessary? We are just going to look at them. Now, the test follow the hypothesis that the variance equals zero. So variation in the variance is zero. That means it's the same. It's equal for all levels of uh, the values, okay? So that means it is homoscedastic. Then the variance, the true variance is not equal to zero means there is a variation, okay? Uh -huh. So whether negative or positive variation, there is a variation and for that matter, um, it is also heteroscedastic. So we just want to go ahead and test for um, heteroscedasticity following this hypothesis. And so if you end up rejecting the null hypothesis, it implies that the problem of heteroscedasticity is present in the model. So how do we, after detecting the problem of heteroscedasticity that it exists, how do we find solutions to that sort of problem? Now, one of the things is to take the logarithms, okay? When you take the log, if you look at the values of the data that we were looking at, so for instance, if you take the logarithm of these values, it would make the values very small because if you take the logarithm of like 20, you are getting something to one or zero point something, I actually forgotten that value. But the values are going to be so small that they are compressed around the line of best fit, all right? So achieving the, uh, the satisfaction of the, the assumption that there is homoscedasticity. So logarithm can really, really help. And that's the reason why in our previous lesson, we learned what we call the functional forms, the log log model, log linear model, linear log model, reciprocal models, and all those sort of things, right? So logarithms, when you take the log of the variables, actually you are going to compress your data into smaller values and they'll be clustered around the line of best fit, achieving homoscedasticity and the violation is, um, sorry, and the assumption is satisfied. Another thing that you can also do to remedy this problem is weighted least squares. That is beyond the scope of this particular presentation. Uh, that's typically those who are doing statistics and econometrics, all right? So they would go ahead and use some kind of formulas and whatever to compute the uh, weighted least squares. So they divide by certain standard errors and all those sort of things. But just I just want to let you know that there are so many ways uh, we can remedy this problem, all right? But for the purposes of the presentation and the functionality of coding in R, by taking the logarithm, we, we are just good to go, all right? There is something else that we can also do to solve this problem, and we'll look at that later on. And then the third one is to revisit the model. Maybe you might have misspecified your model, so take a look at it. If you go and then your model is correctly specified, then there is a problem. And remember, we learned the functional forms. So if you if you create a model and there is heteroscedasticity, then it means you have a model misspecification. So why don't you use some of the functional forms as a replacement to correctly specify the model. So if you take a log log model, then yes, of course, um, that becomes how your model should have been uh, stated, all right? So these are some of the things that we need to look at when solving this problem. So we are going to use the performance package as well, and then the LM test package to remedy this sort of issue. <clears throat> Sorry. Now, before we go ahead and practice this in R, I would like to go ahead and also talk about autocorrelation. That is the last problem. So let's pack it all together and solve the remaining uh, questions that we have. So absolutely, when you take the logarithms to remedy this problem of heteroscedasticity, that means, yes, you are log transforming the data. So again, the assumptions were there. We're looking at some number of them. So we have one of the assumptions, um, where is it? The assumption five, there is no autocorrelation between the error terms, all right? So no autocorrelation. If this assumption is violated, we have the problem of autocorrelation, all right? And so what happens if the error terms are correlated? Of course, we are going to find out soon. So at the end of the day, yes, autocorrelation, no autocorrelation means that there shouldn't be any clear pattern between the residuals. So when you run your regression model. Remember, in our previous lessons, we had something like um, we could calculate the predicted. In fact, when you have a model, you can predict the, the, the dependent variable using the data that you had. OK, so the difference between the predicted value and the actual value is called the error term or the residual. So when you calculate the residual for um, each observation, then that residual when plotted on a graph should not have a clear pattern, all right? 
they should be randomly dispersed, something like that. There should not be a clear pattern. And so autocorrelation and serial correlation are treated synonymously. In time series, we normally use the term serial correlation. In cross-sectional regression or any sort of that, we use the term autocorrelation. So when you hear autocorrelation or serial correlation, they could mean the same thing or similar thing, but then in time series, specifically use serial correlation. So even if you are using cross-sectional, somebody else can actually say diagnose for serial correlation. Is that the same as autocorrelation? All right, so like we said, when you plot the error terms, there shouldn't be a clear pattern. You can see the first um, graph, you can see there is a very clear pattern there. And then the second graph, there is also sloping upwards a clear pattern. And this one to clear patterns. So these are what we call problems of autocorrelation. Okay, uh -huh. they have very clear patterns in there. But residuals should not have a clear pattern. They should be normally distributed, normally distributed, scattered around. So, um, one clue I want to give you is that the effects of heteroscedasticity are the same effects of autocorrelation. So um, there is nothing to worry about. So if you get the effects that heteroscedasticity pose for a model, the same effects are that which pose for autocorrelation. So you can see that here, the estimates are still linear and unbiased, but they're no longer best. The variance is biased, and so estimates of the coefficients are going to be biased. T and F tests also become unreliable. And how do we detect it? We can graph the residuals and see the pattern. If there is a clear pattern, then there's autocorrelation. If there's no clear pattern, then there is no autocorrelation. We can use tests like Devin Watson test and then Bruce Godfrey test, I believe, which are in the LM test package. So we are going to take a look at them very soon. And so the hypothesis is such that the now states that there is no autocorrelation. Alternative, there is. So if you reject the now, then there is autocorrelation. If you do not reject the now, there is no autocorrelation. So how do we solve this problem? Yes, visit the model again. If the model is misspecified, go ahead and write the correct model or specify it correctly, and then you might have solved this problem. There is also what we call the new way West method, an extension of white heteroscedasticity. Remember, in one of the tests of heteroscedasticity, we said the white test was there as one of the general tests. So we have the new way West method, which is an extension of the white hetero there. We used to obtain standard errors that have been corrected for autocorrelation. We are going to look at how to implement that right now. You can also use what we call generalized least squares. Just know that there is a, a method called GLS, generalized least squares, but that is also beyond the scope of this lesson. And then we have the HAC, which is the producing heteroscedasticity autocorrelation consistent standard errors. Huh, so many words. Econometricians are very good at bringing out big words that confuse. But actually, it's just trying to say that we are just producing the standard errors for the coefficients are the ones that are consistent and where the problems of heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation have been just um, um, taken out of the system. So that is what HAC actually uh, means. So yes, we're going to use the performance package. And there's also a package called the QF test. OK, we will look at them. The LM test also there. And so, right, let's go ahead and practice this to, to solve the remaining sub set of questions and then we're just good to go. So diagnose the model for the problem of heteroscedasticity. What can you say about this? So yes, of course, we need to install the package called the LM tests, all right? And then we are going to load it. And because I have already loaded this one in this session, I can even run it again, I've loaded it. So all that I need to do is First and foremost, we can use the check model from the performance package. Um, so, and then we put in the model. And remember, the model that we are now working with is the one that we have actually remedied for um, multiple linearity. And that is the second model, model two. The first model had the problem of multi. So we start with the multi, we corrected that problem. So we don't need to bring that model back in. So we are using the one that we have corrected for multiple linearity. And we are just going to go ahead and diagnose that one to see whether we have hetero because we are solving all these problems one after the other and produce a model that is really good and, and reflective of what we really need to capture. So I'm going to grab the model two. So if I go ahead and say model two, and then let me go ahead and zoom out and make the window wider and bigger and then run the check model function with the model two passed in there. And let's see the plot and let me show you where the heteroscedasticity 
comes into the scene. So yes, we are looking at, where is it? Um, yeah, homogeneity of variance. The homogeneity of variance is what we mean as uh, homoscedasticity. So we are checking whether the variance is homogeneous or not. So the variance of the error term, right? So you can see that on the y-axis, it is the square root of the standard residuals. Yeah. So we have the residuals that have been plotted. So even they give some kind of subtitle saying that the reference line should be flat and horizontal. And is it flat and horizontal? No. So that gives you evidence that there is heteroscedasticity. All right. So this is just a plot that is showing you whether or not there is homoscedasticity or not. So it clearly shows that the line is not flat. And for that matter, that assumption of homoscedasticity um, has been violated. So we need to go ahead and do other things as well. So let me now zoom in. Let's now zoom in, create, and then box on. So um, the graph alone um, cannot speak much. Sometimes we have to report what we actually have in there. So you can use the graph as a, a supplement to maybe the numerical results or the statistical results. So we need to do some tests, right? So we are diagnosing for heteroscedasticity now. So in the LM tests package, I'm going to use the double colon signs to figure out the functions in there. And you can see the BG test, we said test for serial correlation. So it means that when we are diagnosing for autocorrelation, we can use the BG test, which is the bridge Godfrey. And that is one of the, uh, the detections of autocorrelation. But the detection of heteroscedasticity, did we see Bruce Pagan? Yes. Bruce Pagan tests against heteroscedasticity. So we need this function. Before I pass in anything, let me go ahead and figure out whether there is any other uh, uh, function in there to help us do this. Um, DW test, that's for autocorrelation. Okay. Let's see. GK test. Okay. We also have the Goodfeld quant test against heteroscedasticity. So let's bring it out as, as well. Now, LM tests. Any one of them will actually do. All right. So I think that is just it. PE tests, RAIN tests, okay, reset tests. All right, so I think that is just okay. HMC. Okay, we also have another test here, Harrison Maccabi tests for heteroscedasticity. Hmm. Let's bring it here too. So we have the Bruce Pagan, Goodfeld Quant, and then Harrison Maccabi. Yeah, I nearly forgot this one. So let me just go ahead. Actually, you can maintain the package. Let me maintain the package name so that when you are um, looking into this script, you can figure out exactly which package this is coming from. So all I need to do is to pass into it the model, the model two and the model two, right? So let's run the first one. Let's clear the console, run the first one. And then if we come up here, the p-value is 0 0.343. Now, in order to reject the hypothesis, the p-value must be less than any of the significance levels, right? So if we're looking at, 95% confidence level, the significance level becomes 5%, which is 0 0.05. Our p-value must be less than 0 0.05 to reject the now. But we can clearly see that the p-value is greater than 0 0.05. And so we fail to reject the now hypothesis. And so this one gives us evidence that there is heteroscedasticity in the model. Oh, sorry. I had it wrong, actually. The, the null hypothesis states that there is no heteroscedasticity. Null, no, all right? And that means if there is no heteroscedasticity, then it means that there is homoscedasticity, and that is the assumption, all right? So if we reject the null, then we have heteroscedasticity. But this value is not less than the 5% significance level to reject. So we fail to reject the now, so we are rather accept the now, right? So we are just going to say that, oh, okay, there is no heteroscedasticity present. But in regression models, don't say no heteroscedasticity, rather say there is homoscedasticity, all right? So um, the p-value here is greater than 5% uh, significance level. And so we fail to reject the now hypothesis leading to the conclusion that the model is homoscedastic. When I'm getting the script to you, I will append some notes. I will add some notes 
to the script to guide you in the process, all right? And then you can also refer to the video when posted on YouTube um, to follow through. So that is the Bruce Pagan test giving us this results, letting us know that there is homoscedasticity in the model. If we run the Goodfeld quant test, we also have hmm, the p-value to be 0 0.04632. And so 0 0.04632 is also less than 5%, right? Less than 5%. It is greater than 1%. It is less than 5%. It is less than 10%. So when we take the three significance levels, that is a 1%, 5%, 10%, this is actually less than two of them. So the Goodfield quant test actually says that there is heteroscedasticity. Hmm. So Bruce Pagan, we have a problem with Bruce Pagan right now. Uh, so Goodfield quant is telling us there is heteroscedasticity. Unless, of course, we round this one to two decimal places, in which case it becomes 0 0.05, which is equal to the 5% significance level. If it is less than that, we reject. If it is greater than that, we do not reject. But if it is in between, hmm, if it is exactly the same, then do we reject or do we fail to reject? Well, you have to investigate further, right? So that is why I brought out three tests. So first of all, I use the check model, all right, to do the whole thing. Now, one thing is that when I use the check model and I had the homo, um, um, uh, sorry, the heteroscedasticity, that the homogeneity of variance, we notice that the line should be fairly flat for homogeneity, but here it is not homogeneous. Um, the check model, this one, what kind of test is it using behind the scenes to draw this conclusion? So we can do that by using the check heteroscedasticity. You can use the second or the third. The only difference is the spelling. After the S in there, there is a C or a K. It's actually the same thing. So use any one of them. So here, if I go ahead and seek help on this, all right, check heteroscedasticity, we will then try to see what sort of tests is being used behind the scenes. Mm, it is using the Bruce Pagan test, 1979. Bruce Pagan test. So I think we'll go for Bruce Pagan test. So if R has managed through this package, to use the Bruce Pagan test, then it must be a better test of heteroscedasticity than perhaps the Goodfeld quant test. So anyway, the BB test told us we had homoscedasticity. The plot showed the line was not flat. So there's hetero. Anyway, so like I said, if I go ahead and then I put in model two and run this, then it says that one in heteroscedasticity detected and the p-value is even 0 0.010. So the red warning here tells you that there is heteroscedasticity. So when we run this one, the BP test in the LM package, we had a problem. So unless, of course, we have to investigate further, but that is something that maybe I will just leave it there because there are other parameters maybe that we need to just look at. So we have the statistic. Okay, we have the arguments here. The student ties, if set to true, conquer student ties version of the test size will be used, data, the weights, and the whatever. So maybe um, we have to investigate the LM test package um, again, but I think the check heteroscedasticity is just okay. If it gives you the warning, then yes, uh, it means that there is heteroscedasticity, all right? So um, the Bruce Pagan in the check heteroscedasticity shows that there is hetero, the BP in the LM test says there is no hetero. The Goldford quant test says there is hetero because it is less than 0 0.05 categorically. And then the Harris and Maccabi says it is <clears throat> 0 0.051, so which means it is greater than 0 0.05. So we could fail to reject, all right, so that we can conclude that it is homoscedastic but it is also less than 10% significance level. So we can base on that one to reject the null and say there is heteroscedasticity. So one thing I want to say for sure is that the Goodford quant test is very close to the 0 
You see, in statistics, there is a certain term that we call type one and type two error. When the null hypothesis is 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 um um is true, if the null hypothesis is true, meaning you you should fail to reject it, right? But if you reject the null hypothesis when it is true, it leads to a type one error. So when the null hypothesis is true, fail to reject. But if you force to reject it, you have committed a type one error. When the null hypothesis is false, you should reject it. But if you fail to reject it, you have a type two error. So go ahead and investigate these two type errors because that is why we have to use a lot of tests. So when you are reporting, I believe the check heteroscedasticity um, gives us the warning. The BP test in the LM test package says that there is homoscedasticity. So um, at this point, as an analyst, you would have to use your wits to actually determine exactly what to do. If I were the one, perhaps I would have been able to come at a solution because um, this Harrison Maccabi gave me 0 0.046, all right? Okay, so that means there is hetero, we reject the null, and then Goodford Quant gives me 0 0.04632. Oh, how are you getting these consistent uh, values? All right. And then the BP test gives me 0 0.343. So maybe these two and this one says there is heteroscedar CD. Then I would rather go for one of them. All right. So maybe I can just go ahead and use Harris Maccabi as my report. And then they go for a plant and perhaps add this plot to it. If you want to plot this one, you just have to take this check heteroscedar CD and then put it into the plot function and plot, and that one alone will pop up for you. And it says that the reference line should be flat and horizontal. It is not flat. So yes, that gives you evidence that there is um, heteroscedasticity. It is a fitted values, the predicted values against the residuals. So that is how we diagnose for it. So if we have actually detected the problem of heteroscedasticity in the model, how do we solve for this particular model? So we need to run a log form, right? So let's find the log of all of them. So at this point, we are going to use the one that we use for model two. So I'll come up here and then I'm going to select this data, right? Where I've taken away those that were causing multipollinearity. I'll paste it right here, which is everything except these two uh, variables. What is wrong? Oh, okay. There's supposed to be a closing parenthesis. So let me just bring it up here. All right, so we have this one here. And let me show you one of the things that we normally encounter when it comes to data and regression. If you look at the values for um, rates, okay? Rates 2.9, 2.97, um, this value 35,000. So there is some abnormality in the data, okay? So the values are fairly small. There is one outlier. So this outlier can also be the problem behind what we are doing. But anyway, if the values are 2.9, let's compare with the earnings of the spouse. You can see 1,121. And then look at the assets, 7,000, 12,000, 3,000, 8,000, 9,000. And look at the earnings of none of other family members, 291. And then look at the age. So you can see that the ERSP earnings of the spouse, earnings of other family members, and then the family asset holdings, those are holding the very huge values in, in, in the data. As against the number of dependents, which are relatively small values, the age also relatively small values, and then the rates with the exception of an outlier, very small values as well. So when a regression model is run, these three variables are going to pull the weights towards themselves, all right? Overshadowing the rest of the variables. So when we take the logarithm of all of the um, independent variables, all of them will now have values that are fairly uh, 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 similar, all right? So the variation between them is not so huge. And so the log log model is recommended as a functional form. So all we have to do is, let's save this one in another data frame. So I'm going to call this one 
um, hours, let's make it hours work. This is not an underscore, this is around, that's the name. And then I am going to go ahead and take the logarithm of each of these variables. And so I will also want to put the dependent variable in log. So we are specifying a log log model. All right, so let me just uh, write something here. So let's specify a log log model. And remember that is the solution to heteroscedasticity. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to grab the hours worked and then I am going to mutate each column in there and I'm going to save it into the same data. So hours worked after I've made a change. So right in here, I'm going to go ahead and grab each of the columns. So I'm going to say rates. Okay, let me just call this one L rates should be equal to the log of rate. And then L E R S P should be equal to the log of E R S P. And then L E R N O should be equal to the log of E R N O, endings of other family members. L asset should be equal to the log of asset. So we are creating new columns which will take the log version. I don't want to replace the existing columns, all right? Then L age is going to be um, the log of age. Now, the moment you log transform the entire data set, it means when interpreting the results, you have to interpret them in percentages, all right? That is the, uh, the reason why we have to do uh, that. So the LDEP is going to be the log of DEP. So let's do that. All right. And so we go ahead and create our model three. And so we take the LM and then we take, oops, okay. Um, we need to add that of the LHRS, the dependent variable as well. So the log of HRS. And so let's run that, All right? And so we are going to take the LHRS and then we're going to regress it on. In fact, if I use the period, it's going to bring every other uh, variable in there. So now we need only the log transform data. So we're just going to say the L, um, this one is capitalized. So HRS regressed on L rates plus, plus LERSP plus LERNO plus L assets plus L age plus L G E P. And then the data is coming from hours wet. Great. And then let me go ahead and break this one down like that for the model three. And when I finish, I'm going to summarize the model three. So in that case, if I highlight these lines of code and run, and then I summarize the model three, now you can see that a number of them are becoming significant as we keep on removing them. So we have out of six variables, we have three of them significant. Our p-value, um, the R squared is 76%, all right? And then our overall model is also kind of significant. So at the end of the day, um, let us diagnose the models, right? So I will go ahead and say, first of all, let's check. So let us plot the check of um, collinearity for model three. So when I run that, so you can see that all of them two still have low collinearity, right? Great. But the most important thing that we need to do is we need to check for um, hetero. And then let me pass into it the model three to see whether we have, so this one is just to check for multi-collinearity to see whether still the problem has been solved. So when we do that, hmm, the line should still be flat and horizontal. Well, we are not seeing so much of an improvement anyway. So um, let's see all the tests that we conducted up there. So let's check for hetero. Let me bring them down here. And then let's clear the plots. So we are going to check for model three. 
to see whether this problem has been solved using the test. So the test will go deeper. So we are doing that for many of them. So this one, oh, so the check heteroscedasticity in the performance package now says that the error variance appears to be homoscedastic with a p-value of 0 0.938. So the Brisbane test in this particular function um, has reported that there is no hetero. The Brisbane test in LM, let's find out whether it is still going to help us out here. Right, 0 0.9885, meaning homo, because that one means we fail to reject. We do that for good for quant. 0 0.171, wonderful. Now you can see the consistency in the p-values that we're getting for each of these tests. So 0 0.171 also is greater than any of the conventional levels of significance. So we, we fail to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that yes, it is homoscedastic. What about the harrison maccabi test? 0 0.111 also greater than 0 0.05. And so yes, our problem is actually solved. So like I said, sometimes we just need to go beyond the graph. If you remember the, from the statistical concepts in statistical uh, inference, we mentioned that when you're testing for homogeneity of variance and all those sort of things, the plot alone is not enough to show you the thing, but the test will go deeper into the data and fish out the patterns and give you the result. So we rely on the tests more than the, graph, the graphs. So the graphs are just there to give you an idea of what is really happening. All right, so that problem has also been solved in model three. So we just need to go ahead and grab the same model, all right, the same model. And then when we come here, we just want to go ahead and um, check whether there is autocorrelation. So we can say, check autocorrelation, and I'm going to pass into it model three. If I run that, it says that, oh, residuals appear to be independent and not autocorrelated. So we need to perform that using another test to find out whether this problem is solved. So we have, yes, the Bruce Godfrey tests, and I'll pass into it the model three. Not that alone. We have to rely on so many tests. Bruce Pagan is hetero. Um, DW test is autocorrelation, wonderful. So model three. And then the LM test again. Let's see whether there is any other any other PE tests? Hmm, not that one. Let's see, J test, nope. HMC, okay, hetero, half test, linear. GQ, good for quant, hetero, Granger for causality. All right, so after DW test, we have this one. All right, so these are the two uh, functions so far we can get from testing linear models, all right? So the Bruce, um, is it Bruce Pagan? Yeah, that was it, right? Yeah, I think so. Autocorrelation. Hmm. So LM tests, and it was B. Oh, yeah, Bruce Godfrey, not Bruce Pagan, because Bruce Pagan is actually heteroscedasticity. Bruce Godfrey is um, autocorrelation or serial correlation. So, yes, so Bruce Godfrey. So it's rather the BP test that's a Bruce Pagan. Yeah, all right. So now let's run this one too to see. If it is greater than um, any of the conventional significance levels, we can fail to reject it. If it is less than that, then we reject. So let's run this one and see. 0 0.53, greater than 1%, greater than 5%, um, greater than 10%. So Bruce Godfrey test says there is no autocorrelation. And this one also says, oh, 0 0.3, that is also greater than that. So which means we should settle on this particular model for the interpretation or the prediction of the average hours worked during the year. So these are the variables in the log log form, all right, where we can actually do that. You can experiment with other functional forms, like for instance, you can take the log of the dependent and just use the raw values of the independent to find out, diagnose again and see, or you can just take the raw form of the dependent variable, and then take the log of all of the independent variables. In that case, that becomes a lean log, right? So also do that and then test the models to see whether the assumptions have been satisfied. So you can use the log, log, the log lean, the lean log, all right? Uh, reciprocal, put that one aside for now, right? So just look at the log, log versions and that solves the heteroscedasticity. So at the end of the day, we'll bring our lesson to an end on this. And so I would say, uh, thank you very much. We've actually exhausted so much time and 
Um, next time we can move on to another uh, presentation or another lecture. So thank you very much for attending this meeting. Uh, we'll meet yeah, thank next you week. so much. Uh, you can stop the recording. Right.